Hello, everybody. Welcome to the first reading in the Visiting Writers Series this spring of 2016. Apparently, I can't accept a door that's slightly ajar. It makes me nervous. <laughs> if it was wide open, that would be one thing. Um, before we begin tonight's reading, uh, let me mention two upcoming events. On April 5th at 5 p.m. in this very strange room, in the same strange room, um, Jordan Dunn, uh, who's a book artist and a printer and a poet, is going to read his poems, and he's also making uh, a letter-pressed poem for this reading and sort of for this place that everyone in the audience will receive a copy of. So you come back and there's going to be this sort of limited edition broadside of a poem made for that reading. Um, and he is also going to give a talk at three, the way Tony and David were kind enough to do. Um, and he's going to talk about the poem as a material object, because he spends a lot of time uh, thinking about size and shape and the way you imprint poems. Uh, and also, and that relationship to nature and, uh, of that. And also on April 14th, as part of No Hate Week, um, so if you can, just that week, <laughs> otherwise, uh, hi Ashley. Um, the poet SC Says is going to headline a slam poetry event on April 14th. And my understanding is students are going to be participating. So if you want to do slam poetry on April 14th, uh, that's, uh, look out for that coming up soon. OK, and I also want to thank the English department, the Humanities and Fine Arts Division, uh, for supporting poetry and living writers at Carthage. Tonight, we welcome two poets. I am very happy to know, as poets, as I knew them first, and as friends, as I have come to know them over the past 10 years or so. I will introduce them each in turn. And first up tonight is Tony Tregilio. His recent poetry collections are The Complete Dark Shadows of My Childhood, book one, which is available for sale tonight. So see Chelsea after the reading for a copy. Um, published in 2014, uh, and before that, uh, most recently before that, in addition to other books, White Noise from Apostrophe Books, which uh, is involved with the Kennedy assassination and that history, that strange history. He's also the editor, as we heard earlier today, of Elise Cowan, Poems and Fragments from Asata Press in 2014, an important book. And he hosts the poetry podcast Radio Free Albion. Look for that uh, on iTunes. On iTunes. On iTunes. I've never been able to say that before at a poetry reading, but I <laughs> plugged iTunes and probably of what on what I, I wish I could name some other things I should be able to, where else I could find it. Um, and he plays in the band Pet Theories. He teaches poetry at Columbia College Chicago and he wears the interim chair of the Department of Creative Writing. So that's the official stuff that I wanted to mention too. Tony's poetry investigates whether it's the white noise of the Kennedy assassination or the gothic noise of his own childhood. In both cases, he explores how we are shaped by narratives we encounter and how consequence flows from our attention and actions. So the stories we read and the stories we hear make us who we are and vice versa. His latest book tracks the shared path of a child in the 60s and the gothic vampire soap opera Dark Shadows. Anybody who ever watched Dark Shadows? <laughs> Anybody alive in the 60s, you know, it's like the same group of, of people. But you can find it. Johnny Depp was going to star in the movie and then never did. But uh, instead, other things have happened. He did? Oh, it just did not do very well, apparently. <laughs> I missed that one. OK. Uh, and the book asked the questions, perhaps, uh, well, it asked the question that uh, was raised in class in my creative writing class about a book we were reading, but I'm going to appropriate it here and use it to talk about Tony's book. Is it Dark Shadows by Tony Tregilio or Tony Tregilio by Dark Shadows? So who is writing who? And you, you know, you sort of experience these 
forms and these stories as a child and they sort of intertwine themselves with your life and something emerges and you call that thing yourself and who's to say who authored it. Uh, and that's the kind of uh, personal level of the book. It's a fascinating question, dark and funny at once. And it drives these poems. Um, for Tony's book on maybe a social level, I also thought back to the 19th century. And uh, in an essay on Walter Benjamin, the critic T.J. Clark wrote about Baudelaire and his allegories. In any case, an allegory of capitalism is obliged to take the very form of the market. Novelty, stereotype, flash self-advertisement, cheap repeatable motif deep into its bones. In that case, the bones that came out of, so Baudelaire sort of absorbs 19th century capitalism in Paris where all of a sudden there's all these goods being mass produced. Uh, Tony absorbs the mass produced you know, vampire story and then out of those things come these books. La Fleur de Mal for Baudelaire and then Tony Dark Shadows coming out of the, the capitalism of the image, I guess. Uh, my pithy sentence is every culture produces the vampires it deserves. <laughs> And so I'm going to read a few lines from Baudelaire to set the stage. And this is from the beginning of the poem, The Vampire, no surprise, uh, translated by Richard Howard, but it sort of fits wonderfully. The Vampire. Sudden as a knife you thrust into my sorry heart, and strong as a host of demons came, gaudy and libertine, to make in my corrupted mind your bed and bedlam there. So please welcome Tony Trujillo. Thank you, Rick, for that lovely introduction and uh, that that um, that poem may appear in book three. Everything kind of does as Dark Shadows writes me and I write it. Um, but but thank you very much and and thanks for uh, for having us and to everyone at Carthage for being such amazing hosts. Uh, it's wonderful to be here, and um, it's always a treat to read with David, too. Um, so as uh, I'm going to be reading from the project, The Complete Dark Shadows of My Childhood, and as Rick was saying, uh, it's um, a response to, and it's, it's immersed in, the uh, old daytime TV soap opera, Dark Shadows, which broadcast on the ABC network in the late 60s, early 70s. And it was like any other soap opera you'd see on daytime TV. People fell in love, people fell out of love, people had secrets, they had affairs, they had all kinds of uh, discreet and indiscreet romantic entanglements. But the one difference was that the main character was a 207-year-old vampire uh, named Barnabas Collins. And I watched this show with my mother every day when I was a very small child, but even before I had language. So the show became this way that I bonded with my mother, and it also became the source of an uncountable nightmares that I had as a kid. This Barnabas was basically after me all the time in, in my head. Um, and in that way, the show also introduced me to the varieties and, 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 and nuances of psychological life, of nightmares. Of my, it, it helped me understand that I had a psyche, and it helped me... Um, uh, for better or worse, get a certain sense of the uncanny. Uh, um, worse when I was screaming and begging to be let into my parents' bed after another Barnabas nightmare. Uh, um, better when it gave rise to poems like this. Uh, so a couple of the things I just want to say about the project. I'm, I'm watching every episode of the show. There are 1,225 episodes. So it's going to take me quite a long time. Uh, I write uh, one sentence in response to each episode. My only rule is I have to say something about the episode, and um, I try to get my life in there somehow, my past memories or my present self, uh, poems that I'm hearing in Wisconsin or any, anything. And um, in this way, the book, I like to think of it as, a, as an experiment in autobiography. Um, and I'm, I'm documenting my life as I document myself watching the document of the show. I try to get that all in there. Uh, so what I'm going to be reading from tonight, I think I've covered all the um, uh, yeah, pretty much covered all the background. I think you'll see characters will come up, characters from the soap opera, but this is a soap opera, so it may take 60 or 65 episodes to really flesh out what a character, who a character is, and, and so I, I try to condense that into couplets here and there. So I mean, you don't really need a lot of background uh, on the characters. When you do, I might say something, but... Um, and the only other thing to say is I'm going to be reading first from book one, which we have here, 
Uh, and then I'm going to read an excerpt from book two, which will be coming out later this year or early next year. And then I'm going to read something from book three, which is really new, uh, one of the newest pieces I've written for the project, and it'll be the first time I've read it um, publicly. And so, you know, once the first time you've read it publicly, you're a little nervous, but um, by then we'll, we'll have had, the reading will have gone on and, 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 and it won't feel that way. Um, so for this excerpt I'm going to read in book one, the one character you need to know, there's a little boy named David, and he's a psychic. He's, he sees ghosts and visions, and I call him Little David the Psychic Child. And he's uh, running away from Barnabas the Vampire in the material that precedes this, uh, what I'm going to read now. And like many characters in Dark Shadows, he's running from a vampire, and he decides to run into a cemetery. It's a very, it's a very goth show. Um, he finds uh, an open casket, and he gets in the casket. Um, so you imagine you're like one year old and you see this, how scary it is. Um, and what I'm going to read now, he's just left the casket and he's running away, um, trying to get away from Barnabas. Little David escapes, then runs straight into the arms of Barnabas, proving no child is safe in Collinsport and no doubt spawning nightmares for little boys watching this episode. David... You're acting as though you're afraid of me, Barnabas says, sticking out his wolf's head cane to block the psychic child from running away, the same cane that broke my bedroom window in nightmares. Then later, right before the credits roll, Barnabas's parting words, a hypnotic message sent psychically across the Collinwood estate to little David, who, like me as a child, is struck with insomnia because of a vampire. Good night, David. Pleasant dreams, Barnabas says in cruel, sarcastic voiceover. After following his mausoleum plight so closely for six episodes, I couldn't resist looking up little David on Wikipedia to see what became of actor David Hennessy, fearing yet another sad tale of a child star who grows up to be a shoplifter or an addict. Though, can he really be called a star when he forgets his lines so much? So a lot of flubs and dark shadows. They only did everything, they did everything in one take. Uh, then I got distracted and looked up Joe instead, too articulate paragon of bourgeois Collinsport, who looks like the high school football star and student council president who volunteers for Vietnam after graduation. And I discovered actor Joel Crother died of AIDS in 1985, two years wow. before the drug AZT. And he was only 44, not much younger than another Joe, we called him Jojo, my favorite uncle, who contracted HIV in Los Angeles and moved back to Erie, Pennsylvania to die in 1991, surrounded mostly by mean-spirited Italians who could not bring themselves to utter the word gay. I say mostly because I remember my mother spent every day with him in the hospital at the end though she told anyone outside the family tribe it was cancer, and took care of Jojo, her little brother born deaf and mute, like she did when she was a teenager and the rest of the family in that awful immigrant paranoia of the time. World War II and half the neighborhood supported Mussolini until the US declared war on Italy. Treated the little boy's inability to hear or speak as an embarrassing aberration, a shame to the clan. My mother, who once asked me to write a poem about the night Jojo broke from a deep coma and sat up straight and stared at the hospital ceiling like he'd tear it up, burn the fucker down. I was always silent with Jojo in a family that never learned to sign, but he raised his arms and spoke, first time anyone ever heard words come out of his mouth. When, he asked, over and over, then smiled and lay back down to die. There's no real way to transition from that, except to say there's no real way to transition from that, I suppose. Um, but one thing I do want to say is that um, we were talking in class today about what our editorial projects do for us as writers and as, and, and as people. and. Um, 
I wanted to say something about how this, this book, uh, this project has drawn things out of me that other poems and other projects haven't drawn out of me. And that story of my Uncle Joe is one of those examples. I've, I've tried to write about it for years. My mother said to me on the phone, you're going to write a poem about that, aren't you? And I said, yep. And I didn't. I couldn't. Um, and it was this project that just felt like the arena, the space for that. And that's happened to me a lot with all, all three books. Um, there's something about writing about this show that's bringing it out of me. Um, so what I'm going to read now are two short excerpts from book two. Um, just the little bit you need to know about book two. At the end of book one, the show mysteriously, and it's mysterious because Dark Shadows doesn't really ever explain its plot leaps, mysteriously goes backward in time to the year 1795. Uh, a bunch of adults, because that's how I saw it as a kid, they're all adults doing crazy things in the show. A bunch of adults got together and had a seance. And one of the characters got transported to the year 1795, and this allowed the show to examine the origin story of Barnabas, how he became a vampire. And of course, for me as a kid, I, it helped me grow up to think that all adults always have seances. They get together, they hold hands, they call forth spirits, which was kind of nice, uh, even though it's I learned that wasn't really how things work. But um, the only other characters to know in this uh, excerpt, besides Barnabas, of course, are um, a woman named Countess Dupre, whose uh, niece, Josette, uh, is uh, getting married to Barnabas. And Barnabas has already become a vampire in this section. Also, by 17, when I'm in the 1795 narrative, it's driving me crazy because it's a soap opera and it goes on and on and on. And so I get kind of tired of how long it goes on. But that gets apparent pretty quickly. 57 episodes and counting, trapped in 1795. Every day here is a series of prepared speeches, Countess Dupre says to Josette, who can't stop touching her own neck, two fang wounds throbbing. Barnabas steps through a secret panel in the wall of Josette's bedroom, proof for me in 1968 that a vampire lived inside the walls of my own house. No matter how rationally my mother explained that no living or undead creatures could exist inside the inside of our home, dark shadows made me believe in a world of paranormal certainty, as did her books on the Salem witch trials. My natural supernaturalism diminished slightly as I got older, overwhelmed by the insistent claims of reason, the same dull round of everything we already know. My childhood city, Erie, Pennsylvania, was a state of mind, a malaise, a place where homes did not come with secret panels, all the factories were shutting down, welfare milk and cheese supplemented our weekly groceries, and we swam in a polluted great lake barely safer than the fetid country ponds on the outskirts of the city. To this day, I still feel a little dirty when I go out to dinner with friends. If my family couldn't afford to dine out, though my first job was in a restaurant, age 16, my boss, nicknamed Zorba, later convicted with his brother, Larry, of trying to kill Larry's wife, Josie, with the knife he showed off during slow periods in the kitchen. When Zorba attacked her, Josie ducked and was scalped. Her testimony sent them to prison. If you grow up poor, you assume everyone is watching for that inevitable moment that reveals you're a fraud. I expect my fellow diners are waiting for me to paw the food into my mouth with dirty hands, slop it down in grunts and belches. No surprise, Erie's on my mind, the decrepit Rust Belt city of my childhood, long undead before I was even born. I inaugurated this summer, June now in Chicago, metallic fish odor of a different Great Lake clinging to my t-shirt every time I come back from jogging with a trashy true crime tome, Pizza Bomber, the untold story of America's most shocking bank robbery. Any book that sneaks the phrase, the untold story into its subtitle is pure candy. The tale of Brian Wells, doomed eerie pizza delivery driver who robbed a bank with a bomb strapped to his neck and was blown up before the bomb squad could rescue him. Bonus movie trivia. Erie provided several location shots for the film adaptation of Cormac McCarthy's post-apocalyptic novel, The Road. My squalid hometown representing for audiences worldwide what the end of civilization looks like. 
I don't dare read that anywhere near Pittsburgh or anything. There's a lot of boosterism. I wouldn't be able to leave town uh, um, with, with myself intact. Uh, um, the uh, next excerpt I'm going to read from book two um, also has this, I realize this verbal tick I have once in a while. When I get really tired of a plot line or a certain uh, character, I'll often say like, 50 episodes and counting of this, like I did in the last excerpt, and I realized I do it again in this one, so it's, it's a tick. Um, this is, uh, the only other thing to say about this is that book two, um, without knowing it, book two became a real a, a document of violence, like the pizza delivery driver, the Brian Wells story. Also, because I was writing about the episodes that were shown in 1968, which was a really violent year all over the world and in the US. Um, but it was violent here in the States when I was writing it. The, the Boston bombings happened. Uh, 1,200, no, about 1,300 people were killed in Chicago of, of, with guns in 2014. And we got the name Chirac. Um, there was a lot of violence everywhere. I didn't intend for the book to document that, but it's documenting what's happening. So it documented the violence. Um, so this is another excerpt from book two towards the end of the book. There's a witch named Cassandra and a woman named Vicky, and something called the dream curse that was going on way too long for me. The witch Cassandra tricks Vicky into falling asleep. 52 episodes and counting, ABC simply refuses to let the dream curse die. But my mother and I probably didn't watch today's episode, aired July 4th, 1968, can't imagine my father postponing our annual holiday cookout for my mother's soaps. The same day, the Green Berets opened in the US, starring John Wayne and my cousin, ex-pro football linebacker Mike Henry, who made his name in Hollywood as the 14th actor to play Tarzan. Thinking of Henry's ape man career, calls to mind the famous pre-production publicity photo for Tarzan and the Valley of Gold, featuring Henry and Sharon Tate, originally cast as the movie's female lead. She lost the part shortly before shooting began to Nancy Kovac, but the Henry slash Tate photo survives, the two of them posing with a lion, Tate in subdued gray plaid skirt and black hose, haunting to see the image and know she would be slaughtered by the Manson family four years after the picture taken, and Henry clad in skimpy loincloth, Hollywood's only hairy-chested Tarzan. Every time I look at Tate and Henry and Lion, I remember a photograph Henry mailed me when I was 10, a beefcake publicity still of himself from Tarzan and the Valley of Gold, just a standard Hollywood promo shot, no way he'd predict that 38 years after my father asked him for autographed pictures for my brother and me, I'd describe this pose as beefcake in a poem about a vampire soap opera. Henry flexing in loincloth, staring off camera, a military tank gun barrel behind him pointed suggestively upward at a 45 degree angle. To Cousin Anthony, he wrote in scratchy cursive blue ballpoint script, love, Mike Henry. And again, thinking about how violence came into book two, like I didn't, I didn't intend to write about Mike Henry, I didn't intend to write about Sharon Tate, but I'd always wanted to write about that publicity photo he sent me and the photo of the two of them. And then the July 4th episode, the Green Berets came out and I, I just had to write it. So it's just these, it's sort of how the book takes on its own life uh, um, um, without, thankfully, without me trying to control it too much. So I'm gonna close reading an excerpt from book three, which is brand new. I've started it just in the last couple of months. Uh, books one and two, I would take my sentences I was writing and shape them into couplets. Book three is a hybrid mix of poetry and prose. So this last piece is a little bit longer than the other excerpts I've read because it's more prose-like. And um, there's a character named Maggie who uh, is a love interest of Barnabas's. There's a character named Willie who's the grave robber who actually opened the casket that let Barnabas loose on America in 1967. And then there's a person named Dr. Hoffman who's a psychiatrist who really wants to be an occultist, I think, deep down. 
A woman brought me into the graveyard to find out if I remembered being here before, Maggie says to Willie, after waking, confused, in the secret room of the Collins family tomb. It's like a maze, trying to remember a place, trying to remember, then a cheaply cobbled audio jump cut intrudes, and Maggie's pre-recorded lo-fi voiceover narrates her flashback to the night 301 episodes ago when Dr. Hoffman escorted her to Eagle Hill Cemetery. Shock treatment for the amnesia Maggie suffered after escaping the vampire who kidnapped her. A dose of goth science from Dark Shadows prescribing a midnight graveyard stroll to cure post-traumatic memory loss. It was dark, Maggie continues. It rained that day. The smell of it was still in the air, carried by a cold, biting wind. Maggie's aromatic memory of petrichor, the plant oil and geosmin mixture released from soil when it rains, becomes my madeleine. No sooner had the warm liquid mixed with the crumbs touched my palate, Proust writes, of the tea pastry mixture that triggers his exquisite unfolding of memories, than a shudder ran through me and I stopped, intent, intent upon the extraordinary thing that was happening to me transporting me instantaneously to the location, my family's TV room, where I originally watched this episode with my mother on 9-1968. Yes, Maggie, it's like a maze, trying to remember a place, trying to remember. Back when owning a television was such a novelty, we named an entire room in our home after this central technological object, which we'd arranged the sofa and other furniture around. A 12-inch black and white, shoved against the west wall picture window that looked onto our tiny backyard and the sycamore whose hornet's nest petrified me every summer. Our oafish chest freezer loomed between the television and back door, its lid secured with a stubborn gasket seal that made it impossible for a small child to lift. No matter how many times I imitated Willie Loomis straining to open Barnabas's casket, the airtight freezer sealed coffin lid preventing my pilfering of Neapolitan ice cream that my mother never failed to stock along with popsicles and freezer pops inside the chest freezer in the room where she had her stroke 31 years later when the gray and white sausage rope carpet weave became predatory, her brain splitting into blood hemispheres beneath the diamond shaped ceiling lights my parents special ordered in 1965, which I mistakenly recalled as 1962 in Thinking While Held Down from my first book of poems, The Lama's English Lessons. I remember one gravestone in particular, Maggie continues. I remember being terribly frightened and suddenly powdered sugary notes float out of the music box Barnabas gave his wife Josette in the 18th century it's insufferable ice cream truck melody. I, I hate that music box. I just I attack it every chance I get in the book. It's insufferable ice cream truck melody inflicting a tinkly soundtrack upon the scene, loud enough to be heard over the metal gate of the mausoleum, which mistakenly creaks before Hoffman even opens it. Dark shadows can't even navigate a flashback without a flub. And of course, the gate makes no sound when the occult psychiatrist actually does swing it open. My mother struck 31 years later, 1999, in the same room, the day after I tried to explain to her on the phone the editing process for Strange Prophecies Anew, my first book of criticism. Tried to convey the thrill of galleys and my anxiety that I might not find every error and typo before the book went to press later that year. But she didn't understand what galleys were. And now, looking back, I can't imagine why my mother the daughter of impoverished immigrants whose family survived the depression feeding off their vegetable garden, her father toiling days in a rubber factory and nights in English classes toward his fatal middle age heart attack would know what I meant by galley. Maggie's effort to recall the gated Collins family tomb to simply remember a place casts me back into my family's TV room, my mother's eventual stroke room forlorn as the Collins tomb, but without a squeaky gate. Adjacent to the kitchen and perpetually carrying the residual tangy smell of tomato sauce, 
And I'm swallowed by guilt from our final conversation, Memorial Day 1999, after my then wife Shelley and I watched the film Chicago Cab on VHS and finally starting to feel comfortable in Chicago after nine months in the city and wanting to share the marvel that I could attach the possessive pronoun my to a word like galleys and remembering age six, my mother trying to help me find my first manuscript which I'd composed and somehow lost amid scattered doodles and other first grade homework. It was a book of jokes appropriated from Dixie Riddle cups, plastic <laughs> drinking cups embossed with gems like, why did silly Billy throw his clock out the window? He wanted to see time fly. I cut off my mother after my second attempt to explain galleys. They're like the first part you build of a house, like the foundation and walls without flooring or paint. And the next round of galleys will be the house with all the appliances not hooked up yet, which she might not have even heard anyway, because by 1999, she was almost deaf, a malady that runs in the family. Her brother Jojo born deaf and mute, her sisters all outfitted with hearing aids by their late 40s. And I can feel my own ears retreating into murkier mid-range and now I watch TV closed caption most of the time. And I asked her brusquely to put my father on the phone and she just took it, accepted it, like she always did when she couldn't hear what was being said in a conversation, which I sometimes experience now saying, mm-hmm, as if I understood all the talk that too often becomes opaque sound when it reaches my ears, allowing the world to carry on chatting without me, even though my body is physically present with the person speaking. And I asked for my father to come on the phone and we made small talk and unaware of how cruel it must have sounded, I complained about my mother's hearing loss as if it were willful aggression. I think she can really hear me, I said. She's just not listening. And my father tried to persuade me she actually was preoccupied by chronic leg pain, keeping her awake at night. The blood clot we didn't know was preparing to rocket up her body into her brain the next day. And his words nearly prompted me to ask for my mother back on the phone to apologize. I talked to her that night as if her inability to understand galleys, a word she'd never heard before, in a world where she could barely hear anything anymore, was somehow a burden to me. But I didn't. And the next day she had a stroke in the same room where we watched Dark Shadows every day when I was a child. And we never spoke again no matter how much I tried in English and Italian for the next two and a half years in the nursing home. The language centers of her brain bereft of words, dead as anything in the Collins family tomb, wiped out by the blood rush of her brain attack the day after I called and tried to explain my precious galleys after watching Chicago Cab. Thank you, Tony, very much. And now David Trinidad will read from his latest book, Notes on a Past Life, also available here at the table, and I'm sure the authors would be happy to sign books after the reading. His other books include Dear Prudence, New and Selected Poems, Peyton Place, a haiku soap opera, uh, both published by Turtle Point Press, and many others. He's also the editor of A Fast Life, the collected poems of Tim Dugos, Nightbo Books, um, and is working on a collected edition of Ed Smith's poems. He lives in Chicago, where he's a professor of creative writing and poetry at Columbia College. Um, we've discussed the idea of the uncanny in my classes uh, this semester and past semesters at various times, and its literary qualities and one that I find intensely present in David's work, an aspect of the uncanny, is the way they are very present to the question of what is real and what is imagined, um, I guess especially in the situation in which, in, in the most obvious way, nothing is sometimes imagined in the poems, and yet one feels the presence of uh, the imagined in a deep way. Um, 
and to perhaps the double nature of things uh, that's at the heart of that question, that they can exist in two places at once, in a book uh, and in the experience of life, because reading David's poems is it's one of the strongest experiences I've had of that sense of like, um, that, that almost what was happening in the book felt more real than what was happening, which is not an ordinary experience reading poems especially, maybe. Um, in the many poems, especially in this book, that David Trinidad appears, there is the particular estrangement that great writing produces. Is that me over there in the poem? We feel the writer asking and maybe even the poem answering. Is that me over there writing the poem? And the reader is likewise moved between these worlds of lived and written experience, which here in David's work are very hard to tell apart or very hard to tell which one is the central one or the essential one, as if one is experience the, experiencing the poem and reading one's own life. Um, I also looked back to the 19th century. For David, that's actually what got me started in the 19th century. Uh, and I wanted to read a few lines from Rimbaud's A Season in Hell, uh, another work that in a perhaps very different way walks the same lines that we find in Notes on a Past Life. Uh, perhaps someday the books could trade titles for a day. <laughs> um, and I had a passage, okay, I had a passage marked, which I'm going to read, and I also wanted to read this other one that was going through my mind as I, I was thinking earlier. Uh, this is from right near the beginning of the book, a section called uh, Jadi, or Back When. These are translated by Donald Ravel. Back when, if I remember right, my life was a feast where every heart flew open and all wines flowed. One evening I had beauty sitting on my knees. Her kisses were bitter. I cursed her. So that's one. <laughs> and then the other one, that a, a more obscure, a less, a, a less obvious passage that I, um, that I wanted to read. And this is a book about, um, in some ways about uh, an artist coming to New York and coming into a second artistic life, as you already had one in Los Angeles in some ways. That's one of the things the book is. The mud in the towns turned red and black suddenly, like a mirror when the lamp next door begins to move, like treasure in the forest. Good luck, I cried, and I saw an ocean of fires and smoke in heaven. To the left, to the right, all the riches of creation blazed like a billion thunderbolts. Please welcome David Trinidad. Thank you, Rick. I'm going to read uh, an older poem and, and at the end read a newer poem and they sort of speak to each other, I think. Um, and in the middle I'll read a couple of these new poems from this book. And you know, last week at a faculty meeting, Tony said, the empire is dying. And now that I know he grew up on the location of the road, <laughs> I, I better understand that statement. And this is a, a poem about where I grew up in the suburbs of Los Angeles. 9773 Comanche Avenue. In color photographs, my childhood house looks fresh as an uncut sheet cake, pale yellow buttercream, ribbons of white trim squeezed from the grooved tip of a pastry tube. Whose dream was this confection, this suburb of identical pillow mint homes? The sky too is pastel, children roller skate down the new sidewalk, fathers stake young trees. Mothers plan baby showers and Tupperware parties. The Avon lady treks door to door. Six or seven years old, I stand on the front porch, hand on the decorative cast iron trellis that frames it, squinting in California sunlight, striped short sleeve shirt buttoned at the neck. I sit in the backyard, this picture's black and white, my Flintstones playset spread out on the grass. I arrange each plastic character, each dinosaur, 
each palm tree and round granite house. Half a century later, I barely recognize it when I search the address on Google Maps and via street view find myself face to face. Foliage overgrown, facade remodeled and painted a drab brown. I click to zoom, light hits one of the windows. I can almost see what's inside. And these are um, from this new book, uh, Notes on a Past Life, as Rick said, um, about the year, uh, which could be called a season in hell. You're so <laughs> right. Um, and I lived in New York be between 1988 and 2002. And I don't know how many of you want to be poets, but it, it's kind of schizophrenic because you have, it's very private life. I mean, you have to spend all this time alone in order to write the poems, but then there's a, pu a very public side uh, where you're in front of people and contending with egos of other poets and the, um, the poetry world. And yeah, James Schuyler, the, uh, po the poet James Schuyler quoted the poet W.H. Auden as saying, more of this sitting around like beasts. And the, uh, Robert Frost, one of the most famous poets ever, um, <laughs> s said there's only room for one at the top of the steeple. And I was in a bad mood when I wrote this poem. <laughs> no more blurbs. No more blurbs, no more letters of recommendation, no more MFA programs, no more low residency degrees, no more chapbook competitions, no more first book prizes, no more Whiting Awards, no more pushcart nominations, no more NEA grants, no more Guggenheim fellowships, no more MacArthur geniuses, no more Pulitzer winners, no more National Book Awards, no more NBCC finalists, no more Academy of American Poets, no more Poetry Society of America, no more Best American Poetry, no more Poet Moms, no more Prima Donnas, no more self-promotion, no more Judged by Mark Doty, no more Selected by Louise Glick, no more Chosen by John Ashbery, no more of the sitting around like beasts, no more, there's only room for one at the top of the steeple. When I, I read that at Columbia College years ago, and um, I said, right, I said, well, this will do my career a lot of good. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, this whole book will do my, my career a lot of good. <laughs> and this, this poem's about the, the novelist Kathy Acker, and it takes place in the early 90s. You, you know, you, you, you live through these um, decades and then look back and it's like the Stone Age, you'll see. It's like, <laughs> it's like oh, I grew up, you know, the past becomes the Stone Age in a strange way. Acker is back in New York after living in London for most of the 80s, where her post-punk rewrites of classics like Great Expectations and Don Quixote earned her the title of literary terrorist and blood and guts in high school put her on the map in a big way, and everyone is complaining about her. She's changed. She's too much of a narcissist. She wasn't this bad when she lived in New York. Success has gone to her head. I have nothing invested in this debate, have never met or read Acker, so I find it interesting that they're in such a tizzy. It's all about her whines Gary with a listless, effeminate hand wave, letting his cigarette ash drop on our new carpet. He's one mean, bitter little queen. As much as I like his work, I can't, now that I know him, read him anymore. This just isn't her, opines Lynn, fingering her pointy chin, then shaking to convey incredulousness her clown-like frizz of dyed black hair. Lynn's habit of whipping the cover of her latest book out of her purse every time you bump into her has made her the butt of an oft-told joke. I promise myself that if I ever have as many books as she does, I'll be grateful and not harp about other writers. Fame, fame, fatal fame. It's what everyone wants. 
but God help you if you become more famous than your friends. I finally meet Acker, no one calls her Kathy, at a party celebrating Ira's new literary agency. She's every inch the outlaw, bleached blonde hair cut concentration camp short, ears pierced many times over, tight black spaghetti strap top prominently displaying the birds, flowers, and koi tattooed across her arms and back. I'm more impressed to meet Jenny Plath, Sylvia's niece, who works in publishing, and upset when Ira's tall, good-looking intern from Grove Press, in the middle of making chit-chat, looks down at me and says, I'm going to take Ira away from you. <laughs> Ira's a little too flattered when I tell him about it afterwards, and not nearly reassuring enough which only irks me further. Of course, Ira, who's known as a star maker, has no problem with Acker's notoriety. As her publicist, he's traveled with her on tour, thinks of her as an older sister. I listen to them talk shop. I'm the silent wife, nascent, no threat. I smoke and worry about my next poem. Where will it come from? Their talk, which I only half hear, is all about her. Why shouldn't it be? She's famous. Acker doesn't stick around New York for long. She sells her loft on 12th Street and hightails it to San Francisco. Where else do the Mavericks go? When High Risk comes out, Ira arranges for us, us, for us to read together at a different light in the Castro. Acker pulls up in front of the bookstore on her motorcycle, sporting a black leather jacket with red rose airbrushed on the back, some sort of high-fashioned white tutu and tights, and combat boots with silver-studded heels and toes. Instead of our own work, we read pieces by contributors who have died of AIDS. I read Cookie Mueller's story about a golden showers guy, a man into water sports, a pea hag, Acker dramatically delivers Manuel Ramos Otero's The Exemplary Life of the Slave and the Master. Spit in my face, put your whole fist inside me, plunge your pointed tongue into the abyss that I am. On another trip, when Ira and I pick her up to take her to dinner, Acker's listening to Patti Smith's horses as she dons her designer gear a black lambskin jacket with shaggy pink fur on the collar and cuffs. We step around pages of the novel she's trying to finish, my mother demonology, strewn all over the floor. The last time I see her is in New York. For Ira's birthday, she takes us to see Edward Albee's Three Tall Women. It makes sense that she likes Albee, another writer with mother issues. People gawk at her Hell's Angel slash Prima Ballerina drag. How can they not? She's remade herself into a spectacle. The most wounded among us do. Acker's death at 50, hard for Ira, simply makes me sad. An insult after all the AIDS deaths and Jimmy's and Bob Flanagan's and my mother's from cancer the previous year. I spent time with Acker, but never really got to know her. At the first reading I give after her death, I read D.H. Lawrence's The End, The Beginning in her honor. Once dipped in dark oblivion, the soul has peace, inward and lovely peace. The next time I fly to Los Angeles, I ask Helen, my psychic, about Acker. Helen rubs her fingers together, tunes into the other world, and all but gasps. Oh, her transition was magnificent. I make note of it, but don't tell anyone when I get back to New York for fear her friends might envy her even that. And um, this poem is about two poets. I, t earlier I talked about the poet Tim Dugos, whose work I edited. and. Um, James Schuyler, a poet I admired greatly, and they died within six months of, the, of each other in the early 90s. Tim of AIDS and Jimmy of stroke. <clears throat> the 
Dara Park. Dara in the poem is Dara Park, who, who was a, an a artist, a painter, and very close friend of Schuyler's. And I feel, I, I feel like I should explain every name that I can scan. Uh, but, um, and Ann Porter, who's also mentioned, was the wife of the famous po uh, painter Fairfield Porter. I called Eileen to tell her Tim had died. We'd both visited him on G9 in the weeks previous, part of the sad procession of friends and family who came to sit vigil and say, without saying it, goodbye. One of the last things he said to me was, will you look after my work? <coughs> yes, of course, I replied. You don't even have to ask. Jane, who was with him when he passed, said at one point, Tim said to her, can you please remove this torpor, meaning the numbness of the drugs? He wanted to be conscious of what he was experiencing. Jane had been there when he learned he was dying. Oh, so my lifespan is weeks instead of months? His female doctor had cried. I couldn't, three days after he died, sitting next to Ira in the second to last pew in the church of St. Mary the Virgin on 46th Street as a multitude of gay men filed in. One queen feigned shock at seeing all his tricks in the daylight. I refused to laugh, though there was truth in it, a palpable sense that most of the mourners had spent time with each other in dark, clandestine places. The service I endured by staring at the back of the head directly in front of me. For months I was numb, sat late at night sifting through Tim's papers. Christopher had promptly delivered them to me. It seemed so little, his whole life reduced to four or five cardboard boxes, and yet those boxes contained hundreds of poems, largely unpublished, and his whole life lay hidden in them. Poems painful to read, to handle, spread out across the floor, then put in order by year, some, the ones he wrote at the end, his death sentence imbued with such hopefulness, I retyped and submitted to magazines. In the midst of this process, Eileen published an account in her column and paper of her last visit with Tim. She'd complained to him once again about not being in high risk, the anthology that all but ruined our friendship. She turned on me when Ira, whom I was dating, flatly refused to include her. Oh, Eileen, said Tim, let it go. Infuriated, I dashed off a note telling her how disappointing it was to hear that she had troubled our dear friend on his deathbed with her petty resentment. She sent my note back. On it, she'd scrawled a message, something to the effect that I wasn't very intelligent. I tore it to bits and returned it to her an envelope of furious confetti. Our falling out made it into a poem of Tom's collateral damage. Eileen and David are still fighting. Five and a half months later, we'd patched things up enough that Eileen called me to tell me Jimmy had died. She sounded almost gleeful. Well, I have more people to call, bye. We'd both visited him at St. Vincent's the week after his stroke part of the procession of poets who came to pay him homage. I ran into Douglas Crace in the lobby. He was leaving as I was coming in. He made light of our meeting like this, perhaps because I looked so frightened. At the desk, they handed me a visitor's pass and directed me to intensive care. A shock to see Jimmy, rotund in his hospital gown, unable to talk, eyes searching mine, for what? no hiding the distress in my face. I didn't know what to say, no different from the hours I'd spent with him in his room at the Chelsea Hotel, to which he would never return. My eyes kept gravitating toward his bare feet, his several missing toes. Dara leaned against the wall the whole time, arms sternly crossed. Why didn't he leave us alone? I might have felt more comfortable without his watchful presence been able to speak freely to Jimmy. As I was leaving, Ann Porter, her white hair pulled back into a grandmotherly bun, came in. She was, in fact, Jimmy's last visitor. 
Dara sprang to life, oh, Anne. Fairfield's widow, how perfect, as if he were a director and this the unexpected scene he needed to finish his film. He ushered her to the side of Jimmy's bed. Cut to the exterior of the Church of the Incarnation on Madison Avenue after Jimmy's funeral. I tried to hug Dara, but his stiffness rebuked me. Later I learned Ann Lauterbach had the same experience I did. In the wake of Jimmy's death, Dara locked himself in Jimmy's room at the Chelsea and drew everything in it, even its absent tenant. This led Doug to dub him the Widow Park. Dara's own death awaited him 18 years in the future. Blind and starting to lose his mind, he, as Tom described it, blew his brains out. It made me sad, though not for the reason one might expect. I never understood why he took a dislike to me. How many, when my day comes, will have such mixed feelings? Eileen and I, face to face in front of the church, did either of us attempt a hug? I can't believe Jimmy's gone, I said. Yeah, she responded, it's our turn now. I knew in that instant that we would never again be friends. Suddenly we were alone. Where did everyone vanish to? But it had always felt like that when I was with her, that feeling reserved for lovers, like we were the only two people in the world. We required separate cabs. She was off to a post-service supper, invitation only, hosted by Dara. Who else had been invited? Raymond? Tom? It didn't matter, not really. I was going to have to learn to be alone with my grief. She took the first taxi. I watched it drive up Madison and make a ride on 36th Street, then turned around and to flag the second one, numbly held out my hand. And this is um, the final, more upbeat poem. Everyone remembers the Flintstones, right? Even young people? <laughs> um, hopefully you do. And the first line, um, it plays on the first line of one of em Emily Dickinson's poems, Safe in Their Alabaster Chambers. Bedrock at night, safe in their round granite houses from Stegosaurus and Snaggletooth, the cave people sleep. The caveman dreams of bowling strikes with a big stone ball. The cave woman beside him dreams of a new bone for her hair. Outside their round bedroom window, palm trees and animal tools are still. Dinosaur mower and scissor beaked hedge clippers snooze together on the lawn. Even the bird car horn on the footmobile in the garage snores three cartoon Zs. The little suburb of bedrock deep in its Stone Age sleep, while above, stars big as boulders sparkle, and the full moon, biggest and roundest rock of all, presides over the blue prehistoric night. Thank you. with students. Um, I think um, if some of you may have a six o'clock class or you may want to get a book and so I think what we'll do is this is particularly for my I have a class that meets at six um, is just take a very brief break and if you'd like if you want to get a book and have it signed if you need to go to a class and then in about five minutes we'll have a time for some question and answer for people that have a question or have time to sit and talk. Um, so thank you again for reading. Thank you all for